yeah, when I crossed the finish line, I was like, okay, you know, that was pretty good. And then my mom came up to me and told me I won. I'm like, are you joking? <laughs> like, no, I didn't. She's like, yeah. <laughs> so that was, that was a really exciting moment. Welcome to the Canadian Cycling Magazine podcast. I'm Matthew Piaro, and with me is Matt Hansen. Welcome, Matt. What a pleasure to be invited once again. I think you're required to be here. I don't think it was like a written inv- Did you get a written invitation? I kind of picked my own hours, to be honest. I'm my own boss, you might say. I happen to pick nine to five, though. That's just arbitrary numbers I like. Mm-mm. I think some of that won't pass through the fact-checking department. Mm, okay. Who's on the podcast today? Devin Clark. Yes, I spoke with Devin Clark. Listeners, you should know that name. It's maybe not one that you knew earlier this year, but Devin Clark is the national gravel champion. She won Paris to Ancaster, the Southern Ontario race that also doubled as the national championships. And it's uh, it's impressive to see the uh, some of the uh, wins she's racked up this year. So if you don't know Devin Clark, you will by the end of this podcast, because uh, in my interview with her, we get into her background in sport, which did not start in cycling, and where she may be headed with uh, the sport of cycling and gravel racing. That is all ahead. So before my talk with Devin Clark... We have to talk about the world championships that are going on. They just started as this podcast is landing. And I should let uh, listeners know we are recording this in advance. Uh, We are still finding out who will and will not be there. We should point out, too, by the way, that although at this point we don't know all the start lists. And when I say start lists, there are about 10 million start lists because this year Glasgow is hosting every single discipline from road racing to artistic cycling to mountain bike to BMX, everything you can think of. So whoever is organizing this, Godspeed. That's all I can think because it just sounds like a logistical nightmare, but I'm sure they have it under control. I have heard some people say, call it uh, La Partienne's folly. That's the the head of the UCI and his his folly. Uh, Maybe he is, uh, he's quite ambitious in this one, making um, the super worlds, but it's been coming for a bit. People have been uh, gearing up for it. I think it's interesting, too, the fact that, like, I don't think ever you see, imagine a hotel room and, like, Jonas Vingegaard or something like that was walking by an artistic cycling. You know, like, they, they've never met before. It's not like artistic cycling people hang out with road racers and vice versa. I think it's wild to see all these disciplines together. Hey, I know you. Hey, I know you. <laughs> right, right. It's a, it's like a, a veritable Olympic village for cycling, except for the cyclocrossers. Sorry, cyclocross. Wah, wah, wah. Well, I mean, I don't think that having cyclocross worlds in the middle of the summer, even if it's Scotland, would be that much fun. <laughs> you know? Maybe it could rain. It could rain enough. It's possible. It could be rainy and miserable. Uh, so as we are speaking, the, the downhill is underway at Fort William. This is a notable site. It has been a feature of the World Cup circuit for many, many years. Um, Gracie Hemstreet won the junior women's race there in 2022. She injured herself at uh, in a training at nationals so we're hoping that uh, she's healed up and is ready to rip it at fort william the injury list for canucks is actually pretty long unfortunately there is lucas cruz national champion he broke his ankle at the canadian open dh Uh, seth sherlock has a a wrist injury that's still plaguing him Uh, he raced at nationals but uh, is out for worlds and uh, Jackson Goldstone, uh, fingers crossed, he's at the start line. He was having some issues with an appendix problem. Finn Isles, you'll remember, is a junior world champion. He won in 2016. He no doubt has the elite rainbow bands in his sights. There must be a lot of rainbow jerseys there. I'm just thinking about that. Like There must be like a, a busload of rainbow jerseys. 
Like, think how many rainbow jerseys are in Scotland right now. There must be 300 of them and all the different sizes and disciplines. Like, it's just like a cornucopia of rainbow. Arc on CL times 10 million. Right, right. They're going to need to elicit the Care Bears to help them just build all those rainbow jerseys. Wow, you just dated yourself. Uh, over to cross country mountain bike. Um, there's actually a really good preview of the course at Glentress Forest that was produced uh, by Shimano and the UCI. Shimano, I'm not surprised, produced something well, but the UCI, you never really say, oh, there was something they produced well. Fine producers of content. <laughs> But, uh, no, it's a great preview. The course looks really cool. There's lots of climbing. There are some gap jumps. And then the home stretch of that cross-country route, it looks very, like, flowy, bumpy, lumpy. I think it should be quite tele- telegenic. Um, Megaly Rochette is bikepacking all the way to... Glentress Forest. Uh, she departed from Dublin on July 31st. So it's about six days. And then she is set to compete in the mountain bike marathon competition and the EMTB competition. This isn't the first time a rider has done some bike packing in preparation for uh, the world championships. Can you think back to who famously, a Canuck famously prepared for uh, Innsbruck? Oh, well, I was thinking of something even further back, but I was thinking of Swain Tuff riding to training camp, but that's not quite the same. Well, it is the inspiration for this. Uh, Yeah, there's Swain Tuff's famously long rides, uh, riding from B.C. down to California for a training camp. Um, But through that, uh, Rob Britton, I think, was partly inspired in 2018 to go on a about two week long bike packing adventure from Calgary to Port Renfrew. Uh, it was about 1,700 kilometers. He started it 19 days before Innsbruck, so there was time to get that fitness into his legs. Uh, in Magalie's case, I think um, this isn't so much training, but uh, more an adventure added on to her competition at Worlds. And for sure, with six days to go, all of her training can be more or less done. So, but I think it's a neat idea. I mean, you see more and more people doing this. Even Wout, you know, this year he went on a little backpacking, bikepacking, active recovery kind of trip with his buds. I mean, <laughs> something you'd never would have seen in the old days. Some, you know, some Belgian DS with a like, what? You can't ride bikepacking. No, we don't do that. <laughs> it's just not done. Now, as for cross country riders who could do well at Worlds, Carter Woods is having a phenomenal season. He won both the short track and the XCO at the Val de Soleil World Cup. And, of course, he's national champion in both the short track and XCO. Another Vancouver Islander who is probably in uh, contention to do something pretty good at Worlds is Emily Johnston. She was third at Nova Mesto in the Olympic cross country. And, of course, she's our national champion in under-23. Oh, I should mention that Carter Woods is an under-23 rider, but uh, he raced up at, in the elite level for the national championships. We should really call him Woodsy, by the way. That would be a catchy name, Woodsy. Oh, yeah, yeah. No one, no one uses that at the moment. That's just wide open. Yeah, Woodsy. <laughs> well, I guess Michael Woods is... People don't use the Rusty Woods so much anymore. No. Just him. It's not seen to caught on. No. Anyway, uh, other mountain bikers, it'd be good to see Jen Jackson there, Laurie Arsenault. Both of them have uh, Maple Leaf jerseys, so it'd be cool to see them in contention for uh, Rainbow Bands. And a junior star there, Ian Ackert. Yeah, it would also be good to see him uh, mixing it up in Glentrust Forest. And it's his last year of junior, too, so let's see what he can do. Over to para. Of course, you cannot mention paracycling without mentioning Shelley Gauthier. She has a long, long list of victories in the T1 races on the road. The last time she was at Worlds, last year, she was bronze in the time trial. But before that, she had racked up 16 world championship titles in time trial and road race. So <laughs> she's a phenomenal athlete. So it would be cool to see her in the mix. Next track, 
there um, are a lot of Canucks who are poised to do something on the boards. Not least of them is Kelsey Mitchell. So far, the Olympic gold medalist in the sprint um, has not gotten the rainbow bands on the track. She got bronze in 2021, but the rainbow jersey has still eluded her. Um, Could this be the year? Could this be the year? There you go. Uh, She's also likely to get onto the track with Sarah Orban and Lorian Genet for the women's team sprint. They won silver in Milton. On the team pursuit side, on the endurance side, uh, there is very likely we'll see Maggie Coles Lister, Sarah Van Dam, likely Aaron Adewell, Adrian Bonhomme, and Ruby West. I think while they're they are their times are getting faster and faster, I don't think this is the year they land on the podium. Um yeah, I just I don't think so, but um Well some of them in the individual events I could see like especially Maggie, uh after all the road riding she was doing, her kick is still there. I could see her have a, a good ride in, in one of the individual events, so we'll see. Definitely, in one of the individual endurance events. Over on to the men's pursuit. Um, in Milton, we saw Dylan Bibic, uh, Michael Foley, Matthias Guimet, Carson Matern um, racing on the boards. All very strong riders, all up and coming. Uh, well, some of them are here <laughs> world champions. I'm going to have done pretty good so far. Yeah, quite experienced. However, the the team pursuit for those guys is still uh, developing and gelling. I think I mentioned they were fifth in Milton. Like the women, I don't I don't see them on the podium in Glasgow in Scotland. But again, I think this is an important step as we see that uh, squad improving. Derek G did speak earlier in the year of making his return to track at Super Worlds, but I don't know. I don't know if that's in the cards. Uh, earlier this year, he had a contract extension with his road team. Um, and also, if you remember, he was part of a nasty crash at Commonwealth Games, and I don't think his road team was too thrilled with that. Yeah, that was nutsy. So we'll see if he gets some track time in. And of course, we've got Dylan Bibbick, the defending scratch champion which would be uh, a nice to see another another rainbow jersey for his closet which i'm sure he's very full uh and, and we can't forget carson matter and either you know who is now a with racing with the big boys but he's still quick as ever as was well, junior so it'd be it'd be nice to see both those guys pull off some some more results which i'm sure they will yeah carson matern had uh, two junior rainbow jerseys last year in the omnium and the individual pursuit it's exciting on the track to see all of them. And uh, not to also forget Matthias Guimet, who had a really good showing at the Track Champions League uh, last fall, early winter. So, yeah, on the track, we could walk away with uh, some uh, rainbow bands, I think. Some hardware, if you will. But hopefully the best thing would be to get some fabric. The metals are nice, but the fabric is nicer, I think. Exactly. It's, it's the fabric we remember. A nice little T-shirt to bring home. What are your thoughts on the uh, the road course there? I mean, I think it's interesting. It's proximity to, to the Tour de France for both the women and the men. Obviously, the men's is a little longer than the eight days, but it's still, you know, at the eight days even closer to um, to to the road race. And I think most likely two weeks recovery for the men is just enough that they're still a little tired, but they have that next level that you get from doing a Grand Tour. So I would expect the winner would probably come from one of the Tour de France riders. And I think the same for the women, too, you know, because, well, first of all, the best do both races, but that gives them that extra kick, right, that they're going to have to bring into to Glasgow. So, I mean, Remco, of course, there's Remco, right? He's the outlier here because he didn't do the tour, as we know, or the Giro um, or much of the Giro. So, uh, so it'll be interesting to see who where the winner comes from, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I am intrigued to see how Tour de France racing will affect those riders who then opt to go to Worlds. I feel like with the distance of the uh, the road route that it'll favor, uh, you know, some of the, the, the guys who, and, and women who can just, you know, really have it in them to go those long, long distances. I'm thinking of, of course, you know, like uh, Walt Van Aert and Matthew Vanderpool, but uh, even Mads Pedersen, who uh, is a, a world champion or former world champion, he can keep trucking 
really late in the game when the race is long and hard. So yeah, he's. I think he's uh, on my list of possibilities. I think I think at Vanderpool and Van Aert, you know, they've had relatively quiet seasons. Relatively, very relative. I mean, the their Tour de France certainly um, wasn't what it was over the past few years. So I think they're probably pretty hungry for the win. But I'd like there's also Remco, right? So yeah, and I think by quiet seasons, you are conveniently skipping over the spring classics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, when I say quiet, I don't mean quiet. I mean, but when you think about the tour, right, kind of thing, I mean, Wout didn't win a stage. He only got second. Uh, and, and Vanderpool did obviously win the lead-out competition, but he still didn't win a stage. So I'm sure they've been kind of targeting the worlds anyway. I think your hunch is, is very right. In terms of Canucks who could be in the mix, I really don't know. Like, maybe someone like Hugo Uhl or... Um... Uh, Guillaume Boivin, who, you know, have proven themselves on uh, either long, hard one-day races or late in a Grand Tour that they still have, you know, what it takes to be up at the front. And again, that name, Derek G. <laughs> if the uh, the Giro is any indication of his... Maybe he'll get a silver. Oh, boy, wouldn't that be amazing? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Derek, no offense. Silver's pretty good. No offense, Derek, uh, but uh, or maybe he'll just be in the break. No, but uh, joking aside, his uh, his his endurance is phenomenal. So maybe that will serve him here. Uh, and then for him, maybe this is good training for Montreal and Quebec. If uh, if he is to go to those races, I know he would love to do well there. Those races were uh, an inspiration to him early on. So who knows? On the women's side, you know, it's the it's the 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 familiar names. I'm thinking Demi Vollering, Lotta Kopecky, uh, Marlon Roysa, uh, who, you know, are probably the uh, strongest uh, contenders. Mariana Voss, maybe you can never count her out. Anna Meek, you can never count out. <laughs> exactly, Anna Meek Van Vleuten always has to be mentioned as a contender for everything. For everything, everything. Even artistic cycling, probably. If she tried that, she'd be good at that. <laughs> Uh, Canucks, who could be in the mix? Obviously, Allison Jackson. Um, I don't know if it's like suited for like Olivia Burry as much, but because uh, it just you know it's a one day puncher race. But then again, who knows? I mean, the World Championships are always so unpredictable as as predictable as they seem. So for sure, for sure. And I'm thinking uh, Simone Bolard is also um, n- a non dark horse pick for me because she was third at the uh, junior road race in 2018 and she was fourth in the under 23 competition uh, last year in australia she wasn't fourth overall in the road race Uh, she was a bit farther down but uh she is a is a strong rider so yeah i wouldn't count her out (sighs) super worlds a lot of worlds a lot of a lot of bikes I would imagine that the, the people who are organizing that would have the best post party ever. Like it would rival anything. They're like, oh my God, thank God this is over. This 10 days of 18,000 events. Oh my God. But pass me some scotch, you know, a big bottle of scotch. There might be some in the neighborhood, eh? Yeah, there might be some. There's definitely no Irish whiskey. Now, one of the, the world competitions that won't be there, uh, we joked Cross won't be there, but uh, neither will Gravel. Gravel is running in October. One person who may or may not be there, we're not sure yet, is Collingwood, Ontario's Devon Clark. She, as I mentioned earlier, is the national gravel champion. And she is, I would say it's fair to say, pretty new to uh, racing curly bar bikes, curly bar handle bikes. Uh, She came up actually as a downhill skier. Uh, She was at an American university. She was an NCAA Division I athlete. And in the last two years, however, uh, she's in her late 20s. In the last two years, she has uh, really taken to uh, gravel and a little bit of road, I would say. In my chat with Devin Clark, we talk about, yes, her, her affinity for uh, rough roots and uh, what might be ahead for the gravel racer. So without further ado, here's my talk with Devin Clark. Devin Clark, we're speaking a few days after you finished first in your category at the Reggie Ramble. 
That's a tough gravel event in the Trent Hills of Ontario. You took on the longest route, which is about 200 kilometers. First, congratulations. Thank you. And secondly, how was it? How was that race? Uh, It was a tough race. It was the longest ride I've ever done, uh, gravel or road. So it was a great experience, you know, seeing a race that long because I'll have a few of those coming up. It was it was good. It was three out of three gravel races now that I've been rained on. <laughs> so I've been having some some luck with that. Um, but overall, it was it was a great event. Reggie put on a really good event and it was it was a blast. I love that you keep uh, bringing the rain to all these events. So I guess you've got a lot of bike washing to do after after the end of these uh, victories. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Bikes, clothes. It's just, the mud just is stuck in my car now. Oh, nice. Nice. A true gravel racer. Um, I, I did the race last year. I did the shorter distance, uh, around 120. But um, the way it's structured is it's loops and you come into the start finish. You probably came through the barn, start finish barn two times or three times? Uh, three times, because then we came through at the end. But yeah, that was a great part of the race was the loops. I really enjoyed that because then, you know, you had your all your waters set up. So whenever you finish a loop, each one was about 65K. So you could just switch out bottles and it made it way easier for like having that as a feed zone. Totally. But as a, a writer uh, at Canadian Cycling Magazine warned me before I did that, the temptation when you get in that barn is uh, to stop is is kind can be high if if your motivation is flagging how did was your motivation high each time you passed through the barn it was pretty high but by the time we're going into the last loop it's like okay i don't have enough waters left <laughs> for my last round and it would be nice to you know take some more time right now <laughs> but i was i was pretty motivated to go and race and you know feel what it'll be like when I don't have the opportunity to easily switch my bottles when I'm in a longer race or bigger race that doesn't have the loop. So it was, you know, an easy decision to keep going. I appreciate that. For me, I I kind of took my time a little bit. I kind of stuffed my pockets with my snacks a bit slowly and I thought, okay, let's go. The ramble is also known for its ambushes. You turn a corner and then suddenly there's a very steep, usually uh, gravelly incline. How did you find those features? They were tough. <laughs> more, <laughs> more ambushes than I expected, which I realized I need to work on some of my technical skills on that. But uh, yeah, it, it kept you on your toes. So you've not only won the Reggie Ramble, but uh, the Blue Mountain Grand Fondo in June. And another notable win, which is probably what puts you on most people's radars, is Paris to Ancaster. That's the classic Southern Ontario gravel race that was also the National Gravel Championships this year. You, along with Evan Russell, are the first National Gravel Champions. What's also striking is that your first bike race was only in April 2022. That was an Ontario O-Cup road race. You won the women's elite three category there. Last summer, you became the provincial road champ. You're 29. And I want to get into your history with bikes and what has led you to racing them just 15 months ago. I guess uh, to give a bit of my background, um, so I always rode bikes for fun, but like as a, I was an athlete growing up, I was a Alpine ski racer. So, um, I raced downhill super G slalom and then, um, would went to college and, and raced D one down in the States, but I was always biking, but it was more like, you know, once a month kind of thing just for fun or like cross training in the summer. And then in the last, like you said, 15 months, like two years, I just started to get more into it. You know, when I started working, I wanted to stay fit and I loved being outside and I was mountain biking at the beginning and then I bought a gravel bike. I'm like, okay, I'm enjoying like the longer distances and whenever it rains, I couldn't mountain bike. So I started doing that more. And then um, right around that time I had met my uh, current fiance and he was really into road. So then, you know, it worked out well because the two of us just started riding a ton together. And for me, I I needed to keep up with him because he was much stronger uh, at riding than I was. So it kind of started out just trying to keep up with him. 
And then once I started getting faster, I'm like, okay, well, you know, maybe I'll start racing because I, I think I'm, you know, starting to get pretty good at this. So that's kind of how it all started. Also, it worked out well because uh, he owns a gym called Chalks in Collingwood, um, where we live. So he does a lot of like, he does all strength training at Chalks. He does VO2 testing. Then he also does programming for, for cycling. So he's a pretty good partner to have to help me get faster on a bike. All stars kind of aligned to start racing. And I've, you know, I'm happy I've had the success so far. And um, yeah, it's been pretty fun along the way. I want to get a little bit more into chalks, which sounds like it's uh, integral to your, your success, or at least part of the success. You actually have a bio on the Chalks Gym website, and it says you changed your focus from competing in a strength sport to an endurance sport. Now, I'm guessing, is that the switch from ski to mountain bike? Um, yeah, ski to mountain bike slash road. So ski racing is way more of a anaerobic sport. Like our races would be, you know, anywhere from one minute to two minutes long. Some races would be two runs a day. Some races would be one. So you're going like as hard as you could for the one to two minutes. So we'd be in the gym doing, you know, all summer squatting and doing cleans and doing a lot of like jumping and plyometric work, explosive work. Whereas now cycling is just, you know, way more aerobic. So you have to just work on that base, trying to, you know, go out and just do steady state for two hours or whatever, where, you know, it's not nearly as explosive as what I had to, had to do in skiing. Do you still have some of that explosivity, like for the sprints and stuff like that? Or have, have, has the endurance training sort of uh, taken the forefront in, in what you've been doing? I'd say I'd, I still have it. I, it was never like my strong suit. And I think that's why I was never able to reach my goals in skiing um, that I was able to achieve. But, you know, now, luckily, I think I'm in a sport that's probably better suited for my, like, just, you know, where my strengths are as an athlete, which I think is more like my aerobic abilities and um, like my VO2. So, uh, you know, now I, now I have a better sport to work at. Um, but the explosivity, like for what I worked out for so long is still somewhat there, I'm sure. I find this super interesting because this interview follows uh, one I just had with Casper Woolley that ran on the podcast, and he started out as a downhill skier, and he transitioned into enduro mountain biking. Um, Finn Isles, the downhill mountain biker, it was also a skier. Yeah, they're both from Whistler, aren't they? Yeah, or Squamish and Whistler. Yeah, they're both from out west. Yeah. And um, I remember speaking with Casper about speed tolerance. So there's sort of a, a bit of a match there between his, his gravity cycling and, and the downhill. Um, in your case, you were, as you mentioned, a, a Division I athlete, NCAA, alpine skier. Do you find there's anything that you can take over from your previous uh, athletic pursuit to cycling? Or is it more general, like you just know what it is to train and, and work on technique and skills? There's probably a little bit like the the speed aspect of it is is a positive for when you're doing downhills or anything like we used to go, you know, 130 kilometers an hour down a hill on skis. So so speed isn't too much of a factor, which is a, a nice thing. That would be the biggest. And I think also just like the competitive nature of it, um, just knowing to be confident and going into a race and know you've what you've done for your training and you've worked hard and the mental side of things definitely is a positive that I could roll in from skiing. Uh, but those would be the two biggest sides of it. Now, let's return to your mountain biking for uh, uh, just a second. You still mountain bike, you know, as you mentioned. What is mountain biking or how does it fit into your, your cycling um, universe? Uh, right now, mountain biking is more just my uh, my fun training, I guess. I'll go out with my dog, Reggie, and uh, we'll go on rides, which is pretty fun. There's some great mountain biking in Collingwood. So uh, when I have days where I'm just trying to enjoy and not f focus on my training too much, I just that's when I like to mountain bike the best. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, we should note that Reggie, your dog, is not related to the Reggie Ramble. There's no connection there. <laughs> no, different Reggies. <laughs> different Reggies, okay. <laughs> Um, as we mentioned, you've done a road and gravel racing. It seems lately you're doing uh, much more gravel. I'm guessing you like that discipline better. And if so, why is that? 
Uh, yeah, I'd say I like gravel better. It's I find it a little more laid back. Like there's a few things. One, it's great because uh, my fiance and I can go to the races together since men and women are both there, which is a huge positive. I've found a lot of the uh, gravel races at the finish. It's, you know, you go and you get a burger and you got to hang out and have a beer and chat with people. It's, you know, a little bit more of an event. Whereas a lot of the road races, I feel like you kind of finish and get in your car and pack up and leave. So I think just the whole event itself is more fun. And I think for like, at least the gravel races I've done, it's kind of fun being mixed in with the men because, you know, you can work with them and the races tend to be bigger too. Whereas a lot of the road races I've done, there's not a huge field of women in them. So you only have, you know, 10 to 20 women racing, except for when I went out to nationals, road nationals in Edmonton, that was a, my first kind of real experience of road racing, which was a lot different than what I've done in Ontario. And that was a lot of fun, but I still think the gravel, just the laid back nature of it's a little nicer. Now let's get into some of the gravel races you've done this year. I'm thinking Paris to Ancaster. It was your second time doing that race. What was your plan going into that event? Um, so going into PDA this year, I, since I had done the course, you know, it definitely helped knowing what was coming up. So I knew for the first, I think it's about 30 K you're in a pretty big Peloton and you're going fast. And then I know coming up that you end up on like a rail trail. That's, you know, you go like side by side. So there's a bit of a climb and then it's like quick, like 30 seconds. And then you get on that. So I knew, okay, I need to stay at the front and Basically, I was like, okay, where's Megali Rochette and where's uh, Ruby West? Because I knew they were the two other, like, very strong women in the race. And just basically tried to stay up with them and stay near the front. And then going on to that rail trail, I was like, okay, you need to be, again, like I said, near the front. Otherwise, you'll fall back. And then all of a sudden, you don't end up with a group of fast riders that you want to be with. So that was mainly my plan from the beginning. And then, yeah, I actually saw Megaly go in front and I knew she was in front of me and I was like, okay, too bad. I'm uh, so when I was racing, I actually, I didn't know she flatted. So I was like, okay, I guess I think I'm in second and I'll just keep going with the group of guys I'm with. And, uh, yeah, when I crossed the finish line, I was like, okay, you know, that was pretty good. And then my mom came up to me and told me I won. I'm like, are you joking? <laughs> like, no, I didn't. She's like, yeah. <laughs> so that was that was a really exciting moment. Oh, that's excellent. I didn't realize it was such a surprise for you crossing the line. Yeah, I think I would have tried to put a different reaction on my face <laughs> than uh, I had after I see the photos. Right, right. Your finish line shot is not you with your arms raised in the air, I guess. No, I think it's just pure exhaustion. Like, okay, I, <laughs> like, I'm, I'm glad I can, uh, you know, not be going through the mud anymore. So you have been the national gravel champion since April. What does that mean to you? Uh, it means a lot. It's, it's really exciting. Um, I was excited because uh, my fiance surprised me with my chalks team kit, like Team Canada national kit. So that was kind of fun. And I find it exciting to be able to wear the maple leaf on the kit. And I think it just gives me some confidence going into other races because I think, okay, I've been training hard and you did that win. and obviously you should have confidence moving into your other races and having those past results behind you or, you know, it's, it's good to know for the future. The next race I want to get into was in June. It was the Blue Mountain Grand Fondo. This was on roads that you know well. They're right around your home in Collingwood, Ontario. Yeah. Did you feel more pressure with that race because it was a home game, quote unquote? A little bit because I knew, um, I knew a lot of people in town were going to be out watching and, you know, just in the cycling community. So like, okay, I need to make sure I'm (laughs) doing well, but I knew it would be fun. And I had done the course like two or three times just to practice. So definitely added pressure and the span between the races was a, a decent amount of time, but I knew if I raced well, I could, you know, have a shot at doing pretty well. Now, like, Paris to Ancaster, you had a pretty good idea of the tactics and the strategies you wanted to employ at the beginning of the Blue Mountain Race. I think, if I remember correctly, because we spoke 
uh, a bit earlier for the magazine, a short story there. But if I remember, you you knew the climb that you needed to be first up. Again, sort of getting a, a, a somewhat of a whole shot before some of the other riders. Is that was that how that race worked for you, the Blue Mountain one? Yeah, pretty much. So I looked up the start list and I knew there was a handful of strong women in the race who, you know, were from uh, different countries internationally. So I, you know, I had never raced against women like that. So it was interesting to just see what, like have the advantage of being at home against them because I knew what to expect. But yeah, the first climb, I actually wrote it this morning. Uh, It's like a five percenter takes maybe uh, five minutes to get up. And then you go straight into a two kilometer kind of single track and it had rained. um, So it was slippery and muddy. Of course. So I knew I wanted to be the first woman through there because then I'd have the advantage again, like I said, of, you know, getting in a fast group of guys. I saw the one of the girls in the front. So I just did my best to hammer up that climb and, you know, uh, was the first woman in and did exactly what I wanted to do. And it, it played out well for the rest of the race and Collingwood is like amazing gravel riding, but it's pretty punchy. So, you know, you have a lot of steep little climbs and it was a loop, three loops around the same thing. So, you know, once you do it once, you know what to expect for the rest of the time. What I'm noticing is not only do you do the work, the training, that, that type of work that you have to do before an event, but you also seem to do the homework, uh, checking out your competition, checking out the route. Um, is this something, again, that you maybe carried over from your, your skiing days? Or have you always been sort of this kind of fastidious athlete? I think I've become, like, I wish I had this in my skiing days. I kind of look back at skiing and I'm like, oh, you, if you had done these things differently, you probably could have been better. I think I'm more obsessive now, I'd say, um, where I know exactly what I have to do. We'll say diligent. Maybe that's nicer than obsessive. Yeah. Yeah, that's a better word. Diligent or like, uh, I would say higher attention to detail. There you go. I want to do everything I can do in my abilities to do the best I can. If I can look up the route or train hard, then it's, it's nice knowing you've done all your homework. The Blue Mountain Grand Fondo is a qualifier for the UCI Gravel World Championships uh, that will be held in Veneto, Italy this October. Your win at Blue Mountain qualifies you for Worlds. Will you be going to Italy? Uh, I haven't decided yet. It's like uh, on the maybe list right now. Um, I'm just trying to figure out uh, logistics and like how it all works. But I'm deciding pretty much between that and another race in Colorado. So we'll see. I should probably figure it out soon. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, we're speaking uh, mid-July and... You have a bit of time, but yeah, you might want (laughs) to make a call. Um, You mentioned earlier that the Reggie Ramble was your longest race to date. I think your Strava says it was 207 kilometers. Yeah. Tell me about your process of adding more mileage. Are you systematic about it? So for the further mileage, like we have been doing training rides on the weekend that are, have been like, you know, around 150 K like gravel rides. I've been trying to add in some more hours on the bike, but it's also hard to go out for me with a, like a full-time job and do a 200 kilometer ride every week. Cause it just, you know, it's adding a full day of the weekend or that's the only time you could do it. But given the training I've been doing, I think, you know, I still was able to go in and do the Reggie Ramble and my body felt great. So I don't think it's necessary right now to add in the extra time or do those longer rides as like a regular routine. Um, Just because, you know, I know my training's working right now because I was able to go out and do what I was hoping I could do. So uh, I'll probably just keep it at what I'm doing. Yeah, I find that interesting because you... Yeah, these distances, most of us, (laughs) really need a a lot of time to recover from doing a 200-kilometer day. So, yeah, it sounds like you're onto something with rides that you can recover from but still build up the necessary endurance for the big, big days out. Um, How much mileage do you plan to add? Or maybe what I should ask is, do you have even longer events on the horizon? 
Yes, um, the next race I'll have is SBT Gravel, so in Steamboat, Colorado, and that one's 227 kilometers, so 20 more K than what we did at Reggie. But I, I think it's equivalent in elevation. And I also, from uh, like we talked about doing my homework, I've been looking up everyone's Strava and posts I could read about the races that people have done before there. And it seems like it's a faster course. So time, I think it'll be similar amount of time in the saddle. And then what was the other race you were thinking about doing? I believe it was in September. Um, yeah, so I'm looking at doing uh, the RAD in Colorado. So that's in Trinidad. And then maybe another, like a potentially a Belgian Wolf ride in October. Uh, nothing like confirmed yet. So I'm just kind of taking it one step at a time after Steamboat. Right, right. Now, the RAD is part of the Lifetime series, which, of course, includes Unbound. Is that something that interests you, taking on that sort of, um, I don't know what to call it, granddaddy of gravel, the the unofficial gravel world championships? Yeah, I think it'd be amazing. For next year, I I have it, like, my eyes on it for sure. Um, Even getting into Lifetime, I think, would be pretty cool for 2024. So uh, we'll see if that's a possibility. What is your gravel bike? What What's your setup there? Uh, right now I'm riding a Mariposa. Uh, I bought it from a friend of mine and it's been pretty fun. So I've SRAM, like a SRAM ride group set on it. And uh, yeah, nothing, uh, I guess I was going to say nothing too fancy, but I guess it is kind of fancy. <laughs> It's a bit. Yeah, but, you know, it's a, it's different than most. I don't think most people ride on a steel gravel bike, so or race on them at least. But, uh, you know, it's it's been working so far. Yeah, I find that fascinating. A steel bike uh, made in Toronto by uh, by the Berries. So, but uh, this one wasn't a custom one for you. You bought it off of someone else. Yeah, I bought it from a friend, um, and I love it. It's It's been super fun to ride. Interesting. And do you have a... a a one by or a two by setup? I have a two by setup. Oh, okay. I guess that gives you a lot of range for the variety of gravel courses you, you are taking on. Yeah, it seems a lot of people are going one by, but at least the riding I do around in Collingwood, I think the two by is better to have. You just have more gear range and, you know, it's pretty fast gravel around here. So having more roadish gearing is to the advantage, I think. What are some changes you might do to your bike or that you have done to your bike from race to race? I've started playing a little bit with the my tires. I mean, now my clearance, I can only fit a 38, but um, I did put a smaller front chain ring on it because I just wanted it to be a little bit easier on the climbs, especially doing the longer races. I don't want to, you know, run out of gears going up anything too steep. Uh I got different uh, bar tape that's a little stickier. That's pretty much it right now. I have sticky bar tape. I find it is a bit of a dust magnet. Yeah, I've I've found that. But, you know, I'd, I'd rather have the dust stick to it than me slip off of it. So it's a, it's a loss I'll take. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. And you're in the rain. So maybe or it seems you're in the rain more often than not lately. <laughs> yeah, somehow. <laughs> With your successes in gravel events, are you getting more attention on Strava or Instagram? Are you notice anything, noticing anything like that? Yeah, it's been definitely a, a change to, like after, I feel like after each event, I've had some more followers or, you know, people commenting and things like that, which is, you know, always nice to read nice comments. So <laughs> it's, it's funny how things have just been kind of taking off. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You're getting gravel famous. Are there any sponsorship deals on the horizon? Uh, I don't know. Nothing right now, but who knows? Down the road, maybe. <laughs> right on. Um, finally, tell me about DC Cookies. So DC Cookies uh, was a cookie business I started back in February. They're like my gravel cookies, I guess you can call them. So Uh, I've always loved cooking and baking and whenever, you know, I'd go out and try to buy uh, like healthier snacks for either when I'm biking or just, you know, at home and I want something. Um, I found a lot of things are like high in fat, which I didn't want. I wanted more like carbon protein based. So, you know, I just started experimenting with different treats and I'd always send them to uh, chalks, like to the gym with 
uh, my fiance for work. So anyway, I, I came up with DC cookies, which are high, like six grams of protein, 12 grams of carbs and like two grams of fat. So came up with my perfect cookie and would send them to work with him. And all of his clients would say, Hey, we're like, you know, can we try them? And they just steal his cookies. So <laughs> <laughs> all of a sudden he had no snacks at work, <laughs> but then they said, you should, you should sell them. You should, uh, you should make these and sell them at the gym. So anyway, just started, uh, like bought a little label maker, bought the bags and, um, started that business. So I sell them at chalks and I actually just brought some, uh, bags over to a coffee shop called social summit house, um, today for my first, uh, sales out of store, which is kind of exciting. I think they're like the healthiest treat with, um, like the best taste you can have. I'm biased, but the, there's a uh, chocolate lemon, blueberry and chocolate raspberry, and they're pretty good. Amazing. Rising gravel star and rising cookie mogul, um, <laughs> both on your resume right now. And I should say to listeners, Devin and I have been speaking about cookies. Um, that's why I knew to ask about them. But um, stay tuned for a future issue of the magazine where we're hoping to get a cookie recipe in there uh, for you. Um, Devin, thank you so much for your time and yeah, congratulations on your successes to date and good luck with the events you have planned for the rest of 2023. Thanks so much. And that's the episode. It is edited by me, Matthew Pioro. I had help from Matt Hansen. Thank you, Matt. You're welcome. I also had help from mountain bike editor Terry McCall. This episode of the Canadian Cycling Magazine podcast is produced by Adam Killick. What else does he do? No idea. You didn't know he did the music as well? He does the music too? He does the music too. Thank you, Adam. Wow, this is news to me. Also, thanks to Ontario Creates for its support. So, uh... How are you feeling there, bud? Feel great, actually. Why? Yeah, your legs are your your legs are okay. Listeners, what the illustrious Matthew Puro is making fun of is that he decided to take me on a ride on Sunday recently after I'd ridden a big ride on Saturday. So for once, I was quiet when I was riding because <laughs> <laughs> I was I was sore from riding six hours the day before. You had a really big ride the day before, so uh, I, you know I. I think this is the, the Matt Hansen I like to ride with, one whose legs have been uh, quite tenderized. They were quite tender. <laughs> but I'm ready now. I'm fine. It's been two days. I'm ready to go. Put me in, coach. Put me in, coach. Yeah, no, that's what I'm... Oh, I'm sure the uh, all that training is just is hitting right now. You're just... Ready to go. Hanging. Yeah, okay. Well, what I'm going to need you to do is ride for about 160 clicks and then I'll meet you afterwards and then we'll go for a little a little rip. Sounds fun. Sure, no problem. Done. <gasps> oh, always always up for a challenge. Well, thank you, Matt. Um, we'll talk to you later. Thank you everyone for listening. Ride safely, whether that's for 160 clicks or or just, you know, a short short tootle around the block. And we'll talk to you later. Thank you.